Citizens United is a 2010 Supreme Court decision allowing unlimited spending by corporations, labor unions, and other organizations in elections. Its defenders argue the ruling upholds free speech rights, allowing individuals and corporations to express their political views without excessive restrictions, resulting, they say, in increased political engagement and the proliferation of diverse voices in public discourse. But critics of Citizens United say the decision gives corporations undue influence in elections and that a flood of unlimited money in politics favors the voices of wealthy donors over those of the general citizenry, raising concerns about the erosion of the bedrock principle of one person, one vote. In this high-stakes 2024 election year, open to debate, in partnership with the Northwestern Pritzker School of Law's Newt and Joe Minow debate series, looks at the question, has Citizens United undermined democracy? Hi, everybody, and welcome to Open to Debate. I'm John Donvan. The debate this time, it's about a controversial Supreme Court ruling on money and politics, now that we've had a decade to see its impact. The question we're asking, has Citizens United undermined democracy? We're proud to be doing this in partnership with the Newt and Joe Minow debate series at the Northwestern Pritzker School of Law. And we're proud to dedicate this episode to Newt himself, whom we lost last year. Ironically, his two most famous words are vast wasteland, a phrase he coined in 1961 to critique the state of TV programming at the time. It's ironic because the terrain of Newt's life and career was so plentiful, so high quality. A father and a husband, an attorney and political advisor whose ideas and foresight significantly laid the groundwork for how we all connect today thanks to his early advocacy for the development of satellite communications and whose articulated concerns, especially but not only for children, led to the creation of what today we call public television and in another contribution to the culture, his role in fostering the tradition of the presidential debates. Newt Minow cared about history, now he has his place in history. Newt, you are a friend to our program, so this one's for you. I'd like to welcome to the stage our debaters, Francesca Procaccini, <laughs> Chara torres Felici, Floyd Abrams, and Eric Wang, our debaters for this evening. We're gonna have opening statements now. Each debater will speak for three minutes in turn, making their case for or against the question, answering yes or no. We're gonna start with Francesca Procaccini, Assistant Professor of Law at Vanderbilt. Francesca, you are up first, and in answer to the question, has Citizens United undermined democracy? You are saying, yes, it has. Please tell us why. Has Citizens United undermined democracy? Yes! <laughs> to understand why, we have to understand what Citizens United did and what kind of democracy we actually have. What Citizens United do? Uh, it opened the door to unlimited amounts of dark money to manipulate our political process. What kind of democracy do we have? We have a liberal democracy, which means we protect individual rights and the right to equally participate in the political process, to equally elect our representatives, influence politics, hold our government accountable. Usually, these twin pillars of democracy reinforce each other. Sometimes they conflict. And the supposed right to unleash unlimited sums into our political process is one of these times. And that is because money allows for unequal influence. It crowds out the average citizen's voice, and it permits some mega donors to have outsized access to our elected officials. Okay, so what should happen when rights and democracy conflict? Which should take precedence? It has to be democracy. Why? Because rights serve democracy, and actually rights cannot be meaningfully protected except in a true democracy, right? Lots of countries have rights but they are only meaningfully protected in real democracies. North Korea has a very strong free speech right on paper. Russia has the freedom of speech, and we know what happens when you criticize the government there. So Citizens United doesn't just undermine democracy by unleashing vast sums of money into our politics. It undermines democracy because it answered the question incorrectly as to what takes precedence, free speech or democracy. 
it put the weighty free speech right above democracy. And as we will show, democracy is being crushed under that weight right now. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. And now we're going to hear from Floyd Abrams, senior counsel at Cahill, Gordon, and Rindell. Uh, Floyd, you're saying that Citizens United has not undermined democracy. You have three minutes to tell us why. I think it's worth starting, even in the brief time we have, by what the case was about. It was about a documentary which blasted Hillary Clinton at a time when it looked like she'd be the Democratic candidate for president. Very tough, I think unfair, but the quintessential example of political speech, which has to be protected, in my view, under the First Amendment. It was that documentary which could not be put on pay for view, which is what the people who were against Hillary wanted it to be. Not allowed to be. The public couldn't see it on pay for view because of the law at issue in Citizens United, and then could because of the victory of what I will call the First Amendment side in the Citizens United case. Uh, there are hard issues here. One that's not hard is this. No speech, none is more important to democracy than advocacy of voting for, or in the case of this documentary, against a candidate running for president. No speech. And yet, that speech was speech which could not appear, could not be seen on pay-for-view, which is what they wanted to do, because of legislation adopted in the name of democracy, but which wound up stifling free speech. The statute itself, and where we are now, is worth just talking about for the moment I have left. It's a statute which has the effect, the deliberate effect of preventing speech. And what it had in mind, the framers, was big corporations. That's what they talked about. Big corporations, so much money, they could do so much harm by persuading people, by blocking other sorts of speech, et cetera, et cetera. That was the argument. It persuaded a lot of people. 24 years have passed. We have an answer to that question now. I mean, we know what has happened and what hasn't happened now. And the answer is that the speech that people were afraid of, the big money corporate speech, did not occur. It was a myth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Floyd Abrams. Our next speaker uh, is Chiara torres Pelosi, professor of law at Stetson University, and reminding everyone that you're answering yes in answer to the question, has Citizens United uh, undermined democracy? The floor is yours. Good evening. I'm Chara torres Spellacy, and I'm going to argue that Citizens United has hurt American democracy. In President Obama's State of, a, of the Union in 2010, he said, the Supreme Court reversed a century of law that I believe will open the floodgates for special interests including foreign corporations, to spend without limit in our elections, end quote. Justice Alito reacted to President Obama by mouthing the words, not true, not true. History has shown that President Obama was right and Sam Alito was horribly wrong. One of the negative impacts of Citizens United has been a misreading of the opinion. Even though the opinion itself is pro-disclosure. Unfortunately, that is not how the decision has been understood by many Americans. Rather, they read Citizens United as 100% deregulatory, and they mistake Citizens United as blessing dark money. 
Dark money is money that is spent in politics where the average voter has no idea where that money came from. And there has been over $2 billion of dark money in federal elections alone since Citizens United. I wrote about dark money in my forthcoming new book, and as a researcher, I have to find ways to track dark money, because if you only look at FEC filings, you end up in dead ends. And I found two places to look for dark money. One are bankruptcy filings, and the other are criminal prosecutions. So for example, in the bankruptcy filing of the for-profit college Corinthian, you could see that Corinthian had been funding a Republican dark money group called Crossroads GPS. More recently, in the first energy scandal, in which a publicly traded company called First Energy paid roughly $60 million in bribes to the Ohio Speaker of the House, Larry Householder, who then took that money and spent it on dark money in Ohio elections. Prosecutors in that case had wiretaps of members of the First Energy criminal conspiracy literally citing to Citizens United as the reason why they're hiding corporate and illegal sources of funding from Ohio voters was fine. They assumed no one would ever know. Well, spoiler alert, it wasn't fine. This is why the ex-speaker of the Ohio House, Mr. Householder, is in prison now. We also know from the prosecution of rapper Praz Michelle of the Fugees, that corporate structures were used to get illegal money into the 2012 election. President Obama's prediction at his State of the Union wasn't just correct, it was correct with respect to his own re-election. What we know now is that money was stolen from a Malaysian sovereign wealth fund, rooted through several corporate structures, deposited with Praz, then given to American straw donors before landing in a US entity that supported Obama's reelection. Was that good for American democracy? I don't think so. Thank you, Chara. And our final speaker in this round is Eric Wang, a partner at the Gober Group, who is arguing that Citizens United has not undermined democracy. Eric, it's your turn. Thank you. Good evening. Here we are 14 years after Citizens United and the Republic is still standing. Now, some say that we're on the precipice of losing our democracy, but to paraphrase the late Tina Turner, what's Citizens United got to do with it? Nothing. So first, we're told that Citizens United is bad for democracy because it unleashed this, the floodgates for campaign spending. But I think the threshold question we have to ask is, is there actually too much spending on campaigns? Now, in 2020, a record $16.4 billion was spent on the elections. That's a lot of money, right? Well, just two weeks ago, on Super Bowl Sunday, $17.3 billion was spent on the Super Bowl. $17.3 billion on a football game, $16.4 billion on an election. You decide. Now, Campaign spending has also been dramatically outpacing inflation in America historically, long before Citizens United. So why is that? Well, each election, we are told that this is the most important election in our lifetime. And if you look at the example of campaign spending in presidential elections in recent history, you'll notice something interesting. You'll see a spike in campaign spending uh, in 2008 by the campaigns and outside groups. Uh, right before Citizens United. Spending actually dipped right after Citizens United in 2012. And then you see another, another spike in 2020 on campaign spending. What happened in 2008? The financial crisis. What happened in 2020? We'll never forget the pandemic and racial strife. It's only proper that donors are going to give more money and organizations are going to spend more money on elections when we think the stakes are higher, and we're told that the stakes keep getting higher and higher in elections. Now, some people say that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. 
I want to be clear, I'm not here to either support or oppose Donald Trump, because that's not what we're debating, but if you think that Citizens United is a threat to democracy because of the huge amounts of campaign spending that is unleashed, Donald Trump actually represents the opposite of Citizens United. In 2016, Hillary Clinton's campaign and her supporting super PACs outspent Donald Trump's side by a whopping two to one margin, and that trend continued in 2020 and it continues this year. Lastly, people say polarization is undermining democracy, but experts on both the left and the right are increasingly recognizing that the polarization is actually being driven by small dollar donors, the opposite of Citizens United. And I'll just quote from Richard Pildes, a well-known election law expert at NYU Law, who writes, small donors contribute more to ideologically extreme candidates. Most ideological extreme incumbents raise dramatically more from small donors than more moderate incumbents. So in summary, Citizens United has nothing to do with the things that people say are undermining democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Eric Wang. And that concludes round one of our Open to Debate program. Now we're gonna move on to round two, and in round two we have uh, discussion with one another, we challenge one another's ideas in a uh, more free-flowing form, but I, I just wanna say what I think I heard in the opening statements uh, were two levels of argument. One was about theories and principles, and in that regard, uh, we heard the argument that freedom of speech, particularly when it comes to political speech, uh, is not to be curtailed. Uh, but the counter to that argument is that um, Citizens United has uh, uh, allowed for a system where those with more money get more speech and that that's inherently corrosive to democracy, that there's a tension between the freedom of speech and democracy and that a choice has to be made. We also heard a practical argument. Is, in fact, uh, after 10, uh, 14, 13 years, are we seeing um, that, in fact, uh, um, Citizens United has, has caused harm, and there's disagreement on that as well, that, that pointing out that uh, there's been an enormous amount of dark money raised uh, under the regime of uh, Citizens United, that that dark money is inherently corrosive by uh, letting people have uh, influence where the rest of us don't know who they are, that it's opened up a floodgate of special interest, but we heard the pushback to that, that this is a, a set of... Uh, problems whose potential harm has been exaggerated and has not been borne out by reality. I also think that we want to take one moment for people who might be listening just to, and maybe I can have your participation in this, to clarify what we mean by Citizens United. Citizens United was a case in 2010 uh, heard by the Supreme Court uh, with the participation of one Floyd Abrams on one side of the argument in the court, um, making, uh, establishing a right for uh, corporations and unions and others to raise unlimited amounts of money and to spend it uh, their way to um, make whatever kind of political statement they wanted to make as long as they were not coordinating with the campaign. They do have on paper a requirement to disclose who their donors are. Does anybody disagree with that or want to add to that? Okay, I, I want to go to you then, um, Francesca. You've, you were making the argument that there's a tension between uh, freedom of speech as an absolute and democracy. And I think it was clear what your argument was, but what we heard from your opponent, Floyd Abrams, was the argument that whether that's true or not, which he did not address, uh, fr freedom of political speech is, is the one to be sacrosanct. It's more important than all other forms of speech and therefore would be in tension with your argument. So what's your response to that? I mean, one could say just the opposite, that because our politics are so important to democracy, it is exactly where we need to be extraordinarily careful about the lines we are drawing. It's not to say that that means all lines go out the window. It's to say that we have to have clear, neutral, reasonable lines and limits on how money can influence our politics. It is exactly because our politics and our democracy is so precious and so fragile that we want to ensure reasonable, neutral limits. Citizens United, open, it, didn't, it didn't do it the whole way um, as a case, but it started a legacy of campaign finance cases that have basically shut the door on all reasonable regulations. So Floyd might be right that the particular um, case, you know, film at issue there sh should be shown, but that doesn't mean that all political speech and, should and run Fran rampant. And Francesca, could you make, like, you know, what, what's, what's the harm? Well, it, it again goes to what is democracy. Democracy is inherently about equal citizenship. And in an unequal world, 
uh, if you make, uh, if you connect so strongly money and politics, you're going to have an unequal politics. That's not a democracy. Okay, let's take that to Floyd. So the argument, I'm, I'm sure you heard it, but I just want to restate it, is that the, re the reality of the world is that more people with more money would have more political influence and that that is inherently an inequality that your opponent is saying is detrimental to democracy. I think there's some truth in that. Uh, people who have a lot of money tend to have a lot more power. They have a lot more access. They have a lot more impact on other people. But the one thing I can't sign on to, <clears throat> and Francesca was very straightforward. She and I used to teach together. She was always straightforward. <laughs> Uh, uh, but really, she, she said one thing I thought very fairly, and that many people on her side of this argument don't make, which is that there is a sacrifice of speech because of Citizens United. That is the consequence of it, that, that be, uh, had we lost, uh, you know, I mean, again, it's, it's not just the one case itself. The case itself, again, that the Hillary do uh, documentary, which could not be shown if uh, the law had remained uh, as it was, and now can be shown, and that's not unique. I mean, the reality is, I don't believe at least, we have to choose between free speech and free elections. And I think when we start down the road of, of saying, acknowledging, in my word, admitting that the price tag of, of what would have been the law uh, would have been a deprivation of speech. And, and, and is the inequality that of... We would be in a much worse state than now. Is, and Floyd, is, are you saying that the inequality that I think you've conceded is a real thing, is a price that would, is worth paying to protect the speech? I don't think the way to solve inequality is to suppress speech. Uh, and I think once we start down that road, uh, we will have more inequality and less speech. I, I know that you want to jump in, Eric, but I just want to hear from the other side before you do either. either of, uh, the either. only thing I, in, in quick response is, you know, we, we actually rely all the time on government to help with the inequalities of our society. Uh, it, it's not a perfect system, um, but that's democracy. It's better than every other system. Um, so it's not antithetical to think about um, I mean, uh, Floyd's absolutely right that you, you want a situation in which maybe suppressing speech is not the ideal way to fix social inequality, um, but it, it, it can be one part of a broader scheme of helping achieve the promise of equal citizenship. Eric? I'd like to address the equality issue. Uh, you know, I, I first started working in campaigns in a professional capacity more than 24 years ago. Uh, I, campaign finance is what I do for work on a day-to-day -day basis. And it always amuses me the outsized importance that certain segments, and I want to be clear, it's only certain segments of our population ascribe to this issue. There are so many ways in which uh, campaigns and elections are unequal. Uh, you know, if, if money had such outsized influence, we would see Jeb Bush have won at least one primary. We would see Mike Bloomberg, who spent a billion dollars of his own money, have won at least one primary. We would have seen Tom Steyer, who spent at least $300 million of his own money, won at least, prim won, won at least one primary. We would have seen Ron DeSantis win at least one primary, who had $100 million or more at his disposal with his super PAC. But the overriding you know, thing that decides elections is candidate quality, and that's something, something you can't buy with money. And, and there are so many other things. You know, here we are in the Pritzker School of Law. How many institutions in Chicago and Illinois are named after the Pritzkers? How much name recognition does that give to the governor when he's running for office? How does the government equalize, how can the government possibly go about equalizing all of these various factors in campaigns but why do we single out 
campaign spending for, for leveling the playing field. Well, let me, let, me, let me jump in because we're moving now into, I, I, I wanted to discuss the kind of philosophical uh, disagreement and we've, seen, we've had a taste of that, but you're moving us now into kind of the practical agreement. We've had 10 years to see what's happened. Um, Chara, your opponent said in his opening, he feels that the, uh, the potential harms were exaggerated from the beginning and never lived up to. I know you disagree. So what's, what's your evidence of, evidence of harm? So in the 2020 election, our, our last presidential election, there was $100 million of corporate spending, and that's Citizens United style spending, not uh, to be confused with corporate PACs, which is a different monster. Uh, that's a lot of money in my world. Um, if you think about the median income of the average American, it's around $31,000 a year. They'll never see a million dollars. They'll never see anything close to it. So I think one of the impacts of all of this big spending, and some of it does come from rich billionaires, is it uh, is demoralizing to the average voter. They think that their vote doesn't count. They think that it's a rigged game. And the more that there's this huge amount of spending, the more that they feel that their vote is devalued. And I think that's really dangerous because I think, as uh, Francesca said, democracy is really fragile. Floyd? Well, one thing is that there's not a huge amount of increased spending after the Citizens United case. I mean, that, that has not, not been the reality the, uh, that the to run a national campaign costs vast amounts of money. The two parties get that money and spend it promiscuously, but spend it. Um, they get some of it from very wealthy people. Um, the parties appear to have moved in different directions, actually, as to who gets more money from working class people, who gets more money from people who have more money. But however it works, the answer can't be the suppression of speech. Uh, and that's the, the fundamental, and in my view, that's why we have it as the First Amendment. And if I could just respond quickly to Chiara's point, I mean, in my opening statement, my point was you have to look at these numbers in perspective. I think she said $100 million was spent on the 2020 elections by corporations in direct Citizens United style spending. And that, is, that sounds like a lot of money in isolation, but, and I had to Google this, but that's six-tenths of 1% of the total amount that was spent in that election. That's a drop in the bucket, and that's Floyd's point. So I, can I add one point to that? There was also a billion dollars of uh, dark money in the 2020 election, and we have no idea where that is from. Can you, can you define dark money for people not familiar with the term? Certainly. Uh, so dark money is money that is spent in the election. It's usually routed through a 501c3, or sorry, a 501c4, which is a social welfare organization, or a 501c6, which is a trade association. And once it goes through that nonprofit, a, the public cannot tell where that money came from. So, I, you know, it's possible that that billion dollars came from a bunch of Boy Scouts, but I sort of don't <laughs> believe that. I think it's much more likely that it came from, you know. Just, just to clarify, yeah. my understanding is that the, that the uh, Citizens United regime requires disclosure of donors. It does, except that we have a uh, FEC that does not enforce campaign finance law. So you can pull uh, records where it says, we spent a million dollars, and then you turn the next page and you look for donors, and it says zero donors. And it, it's this weird way that the campaign finance law interacts with our tax law, but it is sort of perfectly legal to spend dark money in elections, millions of dollars at a time. If, if I could just respond to that as well on the dark money point. So I used to work at the FEC, and just a few points. 
Uh, so again, a billion dollars you, you cite as being spent in dark money. And again, I go back to my point that that has to be looked at in perspective, $16.4 billion total. So that's a small percentage. And in the 14 years after Citizens United, the percentage of dark money spent on the elections has never exceeded 5% of the total amount spent in that election. Uh, in terms of donor disclosure and dark money, a lot of this money is spent by groups like NARAL pro-choice, uh, and then and their counterparts, uh, National Right to Life, every town for gun safety, and their counterparts, the NRA. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, do you, do you really want to out the donors to those organizations just because they feel they, you know, they're threatened by candidates that oppose their policies and they feel like they need to speak out in order to get their policies enacted by elected officials? You know, so, Two, two responses so here to, to sort of all the numbers. First is, you can have more than one problem in an election, right? So just because, uh, you know, you can have dark money be a problem and overwhelming non-dark money spending be a problem. They can both be really radical problems. You can have, to you know, note the opening, you can have um, former President Trump be a threat to democracy and Citizens United be a threat to democracy. These two things can go hand in hand. And it does not matter just because money doesn't always determine the outcome in an election doesn't make it not problematic and not have the harms that Chiara has, um, has identified. The second point is that dark, dark money and some of the regulations you are talking about are actually a perfect example to pick up on something Floyd said about a difference between speech suppression and speech regulation. The reality was the Hillary film and other political speech, it was not suppressed you may not make this documentary ever and you may not air it ever. No, the regulation said that it might not air at a certain time, in a certain way, in a certain market, because of certain money, right? These are limited, reasonable regulations that do not inhibit the political flow of information, of messages getting out there, and you and I having political dialogue. That, none of that can be impacted by um, can be impacted under the First Amendment, but none of that is what Citizens United is talking about. Eric, what, what is the case against requiring donors to tell us who they are? Yeah, so it, it actually, it's not, it's more than just speech regulation, as Francesca just uh, stated. It actually does act in effect as an inhibition and suppression on speech. Uh, you know, donors to these organizations that are involved in hot button issues like abortion, I mean, look at the climate that we're in. These, these donors, when they are disclosed, they are subjected to threats and harassment. Uh, um, you know, I, I frequently hear the number one concern from a lot of our clients who are donors is that they don't want to be disclosed. Why is that? Well, a lot of them have interests. You know, they want to oppose an incumbent elected official. And if they're disclosed, those elected officials are in positions of power to do great harm in retaliation well, to let, them. Well, let me, let me stop you there and just to take that point and bring it to Chara. What do you think of that justification for non-disclosure? So uh, in Buckley versus Vallejo, uh, the court acknowledged that there could be a harassment reason for certain groups to not name their donors. And that exception still exists in uh, campaign finance law. However, Citizens United lost that part of their, their case. They had argued that if their donors were named, that they would be harassed. And eight to one, the Supreme Court said, no, th there is a voter informational interest in knowing who your donors are. And I think that is the stronger interest that people know who is trying to influence their vote. Well, I'm all in favor of that, and that is not inconsistent with Citizens United at all. I mean, I think we would be very well served by, by knowing a lot more about who's speaking and who's not, and how much money people pay, and who pays what. Citizens United isn't about that. Citizens United is about what we talked about a few minutes ago. Uh, it, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, come on. <laughs> sorry, I'd like, I actually like to part ways a little bit with my partner here. I mean, we're talking about... You better of, be right. On, yeah. on the point of corruption yeah. and disclosure... Divide and conquer. <laughs> on, on the point of corruption and disclosure, it's, it's not 
the spending of money itself that causes corruption. It's the knowledge of who's spending that money that actually causes corruption. These disclosure lists provide readily available friends and enemies lists to elected officials. Uh, and so, you know, if, if you're talking about ingratiation by spending, that's how it that, that, that's, that's how it comes to be, through disclosure. I mean, it sounds like a radical idea, but we've taken it as an article of faith for the past 50 years almost, because the Supreme Court said so, without any empirical evidence that you know, there's this unalloyed uh, interest in disclosure. But you know, Bruce Ackerman and Ian Ayers at Yale, Yale, uh, at Yale University actually wrote about this a number of years ago, and they proposed mandatory anonymity in campaign spending, and that's how you get it. Let me ask, let me ask, sorry, I, I want to jump in for it. We have a little bit of time left with a what if question. Um, and I know this is a long shot, but I just want to see where it would go theoretically. Um, Floyd, you, you made the First Amendment argument in support of the first, first uh, of the uh, Citizens United decision, basically a constitutional argument. But if the Constitution were amended to return us to something closer to the regime that the Citizens United reversed, it would become constitutional. Where would you be on the question at that point? If the Constitution were amended, I would oppose the amendment uh, <laughs> because it has the same, I mean, it's, it's all based on a distrust of speech, the harm speech can do, the unfairness, and we all know speech can do harm. Uh, we have libel law that deals with an angle of that. There are other pieces of legislation which deal with it. But as a people, we've bet our liberties and the success of our country on understanding that speech can do a lot of harm, but that limiting speech can do much more. And that's why to come back to Citizens United, <clears throat> it, it seemed to me from the start that the legislation uh, that had been adopted was in good spirit, for good reasons, understandable reasons at least, that the legislation was by its nature one which called upon the suppression of speech as a basis of making our society better. And that's not the way we have thought about free speech through our history. Well, I, I, and I, not the way I think we should think about it. I, I raised the question of the constitutional, constitutional amendment because um, in September last year, New Hampshire Senator Gene Shaheen reintroduced an amendment that would in effect overturn Citizens United. I, and I wanna to go to the other side. Would, would, would you be in favor of such an amendment, or is that not a mechanism that you would prefer to bring to this issue? I, I mean, I suppose I would be in favor of it only because I think um, that, you know, I, I would like to roll back some of the really uh, unreasonable heightened protection that Citizens United gave to political speech, you know, subjecting every reasonable campaign finance regulation to the strictest of scrutiny. That just doesn't seem to be a workable regime. And I, I think, you know, we've seen through the statistics that it's not a workable regime. That being said, um, text is text, uh, and the, the court is the court. And I wouldn't put all my eggs in an amendment basket uh, because the culture, the free speech culture, the political culture, um, the judicial culture of our democracy, I think is the make or break on um, if we're gonna survive as a democracy. I guess I would add that um, you, if, you were, <laughs> if you're going to open up the Constitution, uh, you probably need the amendment to not just address Citizens United, but to address Buckley versus Vallejo as well, so that you could have expenditure limits, which other countries have, and we think of them as thriving democracies as well. Uh, and this movement to amend uh, has, I think, around 17 states who seem to be in support of it. So it's not just um, single members in Congress who are proposing amendments. There is also a, a grassroots effort at the, that wants to amend the Constitution in this way. Right, well, that, that can be our next debate once that becomes more on the table. So I want to go now to audience questions. Eric made a point earlier, and it really was, I thought, provocative, but no one responded to it. He said, 
what if the Super Bowl, the 17.5 or $9 billion spent on the Super Bowl, what if that was the case? Unlimited spending to describe, to shape your perception of what was being played would people have actually watched if they thought that the 49ers were spending this kind of money and then a whole nother group of people you don't even know just came in and dropped a bunch of other money to influence the outcome of the game. And the same for the other side, people you don't even know. Would people have watched, would they have thought it to Francesca's point that it is even a fair game? And isn't part of democracy the perception of fairness? That it's a, that it's a not a North Korea, not no, a you, Russia. I think you nailed the question, so why don't you take that? I, I like that analogy because it's not spending, just as it's not spending that decides the outcome of elections, it's not spending that decides the outcome of the Super Bowl unless you're paying the players to rig the game, which I don't think is what you're talking about, right? In the end, it's still one person, one vote. I mean, Mike Bloomberg can spend a billion dollars on his campaign, but he still gets one vote. You know, just, just one thing, and, and, I, and I obviously agree with the question, um, in terms of uh, the, the lack of, uh, the loss of the faith and, and the harm that that is. But something we also haven't brought up here that your question makes me think of is um, the very ability to run for office is now impossible. Right, so we think of a democracy, I mean, they were the founders, but they thought of a democracy was not just one person, one vote, actually that was even radical for them, uh, but it's not just the one person, one vote, which we've been focusing on, but it was also the ability to yourself participate, to run yourself, and that is near impossible to actually run for office because of the flood of money. So we cannot run for office, the, the pool of people who we can even vote for has shrunk so much to a particular segment of our society. We're not a democracy, we're an oligarchy. Counter to that point? If, if I just return to the point about the, the, the premise, I guess, of loss of faith, I guess, due to the campaign spending, that just actually hasn't transpired. Uh, in the 14 years since Citizens United, voter turnout has actually increased. In 2020, we saw a record 67% uh, voter participation rate in the elections. And again, I'll return, return to my point. It, people spend money on elections, people turn out to vote in elections when they believe the stakes are higher. It has nothing to do with, it, it, there's no cause and effect between campaign spending and you know, faith in the system or voter participation. I just want to add to that that, I mean, Francesca makes a good point in the sense that, sure, <laughs> People who have a lot of money also have a lot more access, and they have a lot more chance to affect uh, how things work. There are things we can do about that, vis-a-vis right, -vis our criminal law, when, when things get really out of hand. There are things we could do with taxation if we were prepared as a society, and in the name of living in a more egalitarian country, we, we cut back a lot more than we do now on the enormous amount of inherited wealth in the country. These are interesting, and I, I, don't, I don't say that disparagingly. They're, they're important issues, but they don't lead, they shouldn't lead to the conclusion that we ought to change our system entirely about who can speak and how much speech they can engage in. That should be as nearly absolute as we can have it. Nothing is fully absolute, but, but we have more freedom of more people to say more things and to take more positions than really does exist anywhere else in the world. And I wouldn't want to change that. I would just say, uh, it would be great to have Justice Floyd, who would uphold all of those laws, but I am not as optimistic that in the wake of, again, the precedents that have flown from Citizens United, that such criminal regulations or attack right regulations would be uphold, upheld under this current First Amendment. Our next question. 
in the Citizens United decision, the court said, well, corporations are made out of people and people are voters, and yet the people who own shares in the corporation really have nothing to say about the political contributions, which are often either not disclosed to them or not, uh, not consistent with their views. Would you support the idea of better disclosure of political contributions to shareholders and possibly shareholder ability to limit political contributions. And is that a question more to Eric? That's, that's to the yes on Citizens United side. The side that, the side that is not troubled by Citizens United. Yes. <laughs> okay. yes. And I, I, I want Eric to answer, then I'd like the other side to answer as well. Yeah, I mean, m most political contributions are disclosed as a matter of law. Uh, if you're giving to, in, st in half of the states, more than half of the states actually perhaps, where corporate contributions to candidates are permitted, those are required to be disclosed by law. Uh, contributions, corporate contributions to PACs are required to be disclosed by law. I think what you're getting at is this issue of both dark money and so-called gray money where corporations are giving to 501c corporations, which w were the precise issue in Citizens United. Or uh, other intermediaries like the Business Roundtable and the Chamber of Commerce, yeah. Yeah, I mean, by, by law, those organizations are required to be operated uh, primarily for non-political purposes. And, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of corporations do voluntarily uh, disclose their payments to those so shouldn't they all? as well. I'm, I'm sorry? Shouldn't they all then? No, I think it's a matter of choice. Uh, I mean, okay. I... Okay, you're not supposed to debate the debater. <laughs> <laughs> just just want to understand. Let, 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 me let, let me let Chara, if you'd like to jump in on that. Yes, um, so one of the things that I've worked on over the past decade is trying to get the Securities and Exchange Commission to promulgate a rule that would require disclosure of corporate political spending to shareholders. Now, um, I must have hit a nerve, because at some point, um, Mitch McConnell uh, added a rider to the federal budget that says that the SEC can't promulgate that dark money rule. And that's part of why we don't have it yet. Um, but it's not just the Securities and Exchange Commission that could do such a rulemaking. Uh, a functioning federal election commission, perhaps even um, the best rules we've gotten so far have been out of the FCC. So to the extent that you're talking about broadcast ads, you can have more disclosure through the FCC. But as more ads are going online, they're falling into this black hole of they're not captured by our regulatory system because uh, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, otherwise known as BICRA or McCain-Feingold, it was aimed at broadcast ads, but that is not how advertising is done in campaigns anymore. And you, all of those ads that show up on your Facebook feed, in your Twitter feed, because they are online, most of them are not regulated, and we have to close that loophole. Another question, please. Hi, um, so Tiara, you mentioned in your introduction, specifically the State of the Union address after Citizens United came out, uh, President Obama specifically mentioned his concern with foreign corporations spending money on American elections. And I just wanted to hear a little more about the extent to which um, such a thing has occurred, and if so, how can we um, you know, defend our elections from foreign corporations? Well, first, money? foreign spending here is illegal it's for foreign corporations, etc. Uh, and it was illegal when President Obama said what he did. Is it enforced enough? Is there a way to be more rigorous, more meaningful in a sense, to make sure that it doesn't really happen? Uh, I don't have a view on that, but I suspect I'm as suspicious as you about whether in fact it, it works out so that it really accomplishes its, its aim. But, but I have to say that none of that ought to lead to an abandonment of our First Amendment rights as Citizens United would have done. We need more law enforcement. We need more care taken. We need functioning, F FTC, FCC, uh, and the like, but, but lest we walk away today <laughs> thinking all is for naught, uh, right, well, I, the, the reality is 
we, we can do that. We don't. Chara, but think, it's not Citizens I think you United. I think Tara was addressing the question, so I just wanted to make sure it comes back oh, to Oh, sure. Um, so, yes, foreign individuals are banned from spending in uh, U.S. elections. However, because the FEC hasn't promulgated a clear rule about what would make a corporation, quote, foreign, it has left this ambiguity. It's defined by statute. It's, it's defined by the speaker. <laughs> yes, though the FEC has been sued many, many times for not enforcing its own uh, campaign finance laws. Uh, and so there is this gap where it's ambiguous what should be covered. And there's a really famous example of this. So there was this foreign pornographer, and he spent in an LA election, and there were complaints to the California authorities and to the FEC, and they have concurrent overlapping jurisdiction in this particular matter. The FEC did nothing. The California um, regulators actually fined them because they said that was an illegal use of foreign money. Uh, here. Qu question for Eric. You seem to be on the side where political speech should be anonymous. If you're standing on this side of Citizens United where you're saying that the solution to harmful speech is more speech, how do you comport that with anonymity? Shouldn't you have to defend your positions if you're going to speak on the political process? I, I th I think, again, I'm all about choice. I think it's the right of individuals, it's the right of organizations to choose whether or not they wish to disclose themselves and to disclose their donors and uh, to leave it up to the voters to, dis to evaluate the credibility of their speech. And if it's important for you as a voter to know who is funding an organization that's speaking, then you are free to discount uh, uh, that organization's viewpoints and their speech. Uh, but it, sh it should be a, a you know, mutually voluntary system where everybody gets to choose what value, you know, how much, Credence they ascribe to a speaker, and you know whether the speaker can, wishes can, can to disclose. I, can I jump in and just ask the questioner to, if this is honing your question? Are are you suggesting that anonymity is necessarily corrosive? Particularly, I guess, during a time of rising foreign influence in elections, if we're just going to allow any corporation not disclose their donors, even if it's technically illegal for a foreign institution or person to donate to elections. If you're just saying they're anonymous, it seems to open the door to those kind of speech from foreign okay. institutions. Yeah, I mean, the Russian, troll, the Russian troll farms that are posting divisive messages on Facebook and other social media platforms, they don't care about disclosure laws. I mean, you could, sit, you could mandate disclosure, just like you could outlaw murder, but murder is still going to happen. Uh, you know, th these bad actors are still going to be bad actors, uh, and it's the... Americans, you know, it's the innocent Americans who want to exercise their First Amendment rights lawfully who get caught in the crossfire. And, and just going to the point about disclosure and gray money and dark money and corporations giving to 501c corporations, here's an example of why we don't want to mandate that type of disclosure. Let's say you're a corporation that wants to give to the U.S. Chamber, Chamber of Commerce in order to oppose trade tariffs. And you've got this administration hell-bent on imposing trade tariffs and hell-bent on exacting revenge against anybody who opposes that administration, what do you, I mean, do you think that corporations are going to want to give to the Chamber of Commerce? I'm going to, to I'm going to jump in there at that rhetorical question because we're running short of time and I think we have time for two more questions and we have two more questioners. So I'm going to go to this side and we're going to have to keep the questions and the answers brief for this one. Thank you. I have a question for the two gentlemen. Uh, Republican Congressman uh, Bob Inglis from South Carolina reported that when he uh, imprudently changed his position on climate change. He was approached by corporate donors who told him that unless he repented, they were going to drive him out, they're going to find someone to run against him in the primary and fund them to the max and, and kick him out of office. He didn't repent, they did. They found Trey Gowdy who replaced him and the only difference in the two platforms between Inglis and Gowdy was on climate change. Uh, Later on, of course, they found that those uh, corporate donors uh, knew all along they were pushing junk science, but that's a, a story for 20 years later. Uh, how does that square with Justice Kennedy's view in, in uh, Citizens United that corporate contributions don't create even the appearance of uh, impropriety or corruption? 
Floyd, do you want to take that one? I've, I'm tempted to say no, but, but <laughs> uh, uh, I don't think it does, because there are circumstances, such as you've identified, uh, in which it does. I do think that as a general proposition, I think we should have more disclosure uh, rather than less. The Supreme Court is moving in the opposite direction. But I think, uh, to, to cite the one very brief example, we had a situation in Grand Central Station in New York uh, when President Obama was in power where there was an enormous sign announcing his health care proposal, which was there forever, with no disclosure as to who put it up. Uh, it was a conservative foundation, uh, with no way for the public to know who was speaking. I think, since you asked, that, that there ought to be a lot more requirements of public disclosure um, and more uh, what, tolerance on the Supreme Court okay. uh, for statutes. Can, can I follow up on that? I, I, I'm going to jump in because I haven't heard from your opponents for quite some time. Although I think I heard your argument just made by the other side. No, I think that's exactly right. I, I, I will only add briefly that uh, the, the appearance of corruption and corruption itself, uh, it's a very thin line between the two when it comes to the question we are asking, when it comes to whether this type of regime undermines democracy. Of course, there's an actual difference between real corruption and the appearance of corruption, but not when we are asking about whether or not our faith and participation in democracy as citizens is being corroded. So I think that's exactly right. It, it, can I just respond quickly? Can you do it in 20 seconds? Because we are no, one really minute away from wrapping this session. We have one time. more question to get to. So go for 20 seconds. Just, just another example along those lines. So the pro-choice groups tried a similar tactic with Senator Susan Collins when, I forget which Supreme Court justice nominee was up, and they tried to pressure her to vote against uh, what was perceived to be a pro-life Supreme Court nominee, and she withstood the pressure and said no. But, I mean, do you think that it was improper for a pro-choice group to try to uh, pressure their elected officials okay. to uh, no, a vote a certain question, way but on their, their issue? I, with everybody's indulgence, so I'm going to go, I'm going to break the rule a little bit and go about three minutes over if everybody's okay. Uh, for this section. I, so you're the last question. I hope it's fantastic because I'm making special points. <laughs> quite, uh, quite the standard. Um, so Floyd, you mentioned that the primary point here is in service of free speech and not infringing upon free speech and encouraging it. Um, but you also mentioned that we do have laws that protect individuals against harmful speech, narrow as they may be. We also have laws that protect groups of people from harmful speech. Now, Francesca, you mentioned that the primary service of free speech is in service to democracy. So then where do we draw the line between when speech that is harmful becomes broad enough to no longer be particularized to be damaging? Where do we draw that line in the okay. size of that free speech you, that's you harmful? You lived up to the great question task. That was Thank really you. good. Um, why don't we take it? It's a very, very deep philosophical question, I think, and practical as well. Well, I think the first part, and this is in the spirit of the debate, is to acknowledge this is not an easy question. I mean, clearly we win, but this is not. Uh, this, is, this is actually, Citizens United is the crux of one of the deepest, hardest questions at the, the cleavage point between um, free speech and democracy. Uh, uh, and you're asking the limiting principle. Um, I think the first point is just, there should be a limiting principle, that when we don't have any reasonable limiting principle, we are only falling off the cliff into corrosion. Okay, next, what should the limiting principle be? Well, that's the, actually the beautiful part about democracy. You experiment, you try, you see what works and what doesn't work, and you have a functioning political system of which too much money in politics is only problem number one. We've got like a list of 10 to go through, but if you can get through all those checkpoints and you have a functioning democracy, you can find a limiting principle through experimentation, through popular input, through consideration of constitutional values, and it's an all of the above inquiry that I genuinely believe we are up to the task. Okay, Floyd, you get the last word in this round and you get to be pithy. My answer is that that's why I taught with her. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that concludes this round of our Open to Debate program.
And now we move on to our closing round. And in our closing round, each of the debaters will make, take two minutes to sum up their position and try one more time to persuade you to, in your mind to answer yes or no to the question. And Francesca, you are speaking first. You are answering yes to the question, has Citizens United uh, undermined democracy? Your last chance to tell us why. So money has severed the link between the people and our democracy. Uh, and our, our free speech, you know, it means little if we cannot meaningfully influence politics, run for office, or hold our government officials accountable. Um, that near 17 billion we spent in 2020, uh, that is the, more than the GDP of 90 countries. And that was $10 billion more than what was spent before Citizens United was decided. Our last midterms spent 30% more than the midterms just before. It now costs four and a half million dollars to win a House seat and 17 and a half million dollars to win a Senate seat. And you know what? It's not better at the local or state level. 20% of Americans live under minority rule. More than 60% of all elected positions in the country um, are, are, are occupied by white men when they are 30% of the actual population. Uh, the, nine, the incumbency rate in this country is 95% for all elected officials, and 4% of Americans actually think that our politics are working. How do you square these numbers? Money has a lot to do with it. A couple of years ago, I was meeting a friend for coffee, and uh, it was election day. And so I said, you know, can we stop by the polls to vote on the way? Sure. Uh, drove up, parked right outside at the door, said, I'll wait here. I said, oh, aren't you registered? Yes. Is there a reason you can't vote? No. So why don't we go together? He said, what's the point? My voice doesn't count. They don't listen to me. That's the consequence of money in politics. That disenfranchisement, disengagement, disillusion, that's how Citizens United has undermined democracy. Thank you, Francesca. Um, Eric Wang, you are up next with your closing statement and reminding everyone your answer to the question is no, the Citizens United has not undermined democracy. I'd like to just briefly address uh, the point that Francesca made about diversity and throw out some numbers of my own. When Citizens United was decided, there were 82 women in Congress. Today, there are 151, an 84% increase. When Citizens United was decided, there were 73 members of Congress who identified as racial minorities. Today, there are 137, an 88% increase. When CU was decided, there were three openly LGBT members of Congress. Today, there are 13, a more than 300% increase. So I'd like to ask you to think of this debate as an analogy with an election campaign. Uh, just as the two sides are trying to convince you of their positions, uh, Two sides in a campaign are trying to convince you of their positions. And just as it took money to put on this event and to get the speakers here, uh, it takes money to put on campaign events to get the candidates before voters and to get their messages out. But should the four of us here on this debate stage have a monopoly on the debate over Citizens United? Should candidates have a monopoly on speaking about the elections? Now, outside of this debate hall, there is an organization called and Citizens United. It's a 501c4 so-called dark money organization, not required to disclose its donors, that raises and spends millions of dollars, ironically, to counteract the Citizens United decision. It even has multiple PACs that give money to candidates that support the gr group's uh, agenda. Now, money isn't speech, but it takes money to speak. Before Citizens United, nonprofit 501c corporations like End Citizens United were prohibited, prohibited from advocating against candidates that it opposed. Before Citizens, Citizens United, PACs could only accept $5,000 from do donors to support or oppose candidates, uh, so thereby limiting how much they could speak. 
Citizens United doesn't undermine democracy, it makes it better. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And next up uh, is Chara torres Pelosi. And Chara, once again, reminding folks you are answering, yes, it does undermine democracy. Your last chance to tell us why. Okay. In the prosecution of cryptocurrency miscreant Sam Bankman-Fried, uh, the public could finally see behind the curtain of FTX's dark money spending. And what they could see were executives in their 20s stealing money from customers and taking corporate funds and spending it in American politics. Two FTX executives have pleaded guilty to this elaborate scheme, which included $100 million in illegal corporate funds that went into the 2020 and 2022 elections. Because the US Marshals are now clawing back these political expenditures as fruits of crimes, the public can finally see which politicians and which groups were supported. We know that the FTX money went publicly to Democrats and secretly to Republicans. When asked about this while under indictment for campaign finance crimes, Sam Bankman-Fried linked Citizens United to dark money. He said, quote, that was not generally known, i.e. his dark money spending, because despite Citizens United being literally the highest profile Supreme Court case of the decade and the thing everyone talks about when they talk about campaign finance, for some reason, in practice, no one could possibly fathom the idea that someone in practice would actually give dark. I, all of my Republican donations were dark, end quote. The American public doesn't know whether it was FTX's dark money that generated the dysfunctional House of Representatives we have now. We know that FTX gave to Republicans because Republicans have returned the money to the US Marshals. We have to think about the big picture. What would a cryptocurrency uh, company want? I think that they would want a deregulated legal environment and nothing would facilitate that better than a split and dysfunctional Congress, which is unlikely to produce any new laws to regulate their industry. But there are knock-on effects for all of us. Congress has also struggled to pass the federal budget, and we're about to hit another fiscal cliff. We also can't fund aid to the struggling democracy in Ukraine. Is that good for American democracy? Clearly not. Thank you, Chara. And now to bring it home, our last uh, closing statement will come from Floyd Abrams. Floyd, for those who might not remember at this point, I just want to remind them that you're arguing, as you did many years ago, that Citizens United does not undermine democracy. Your last chance to tell us why. I've also had other clients. <laughs> uh, uh, but it is, the, it is the case that I took that case because I really believed that the legislation at issue uh, did threaten serious First Amendment principles, and that is what the Supreme Court ultimately held. i just say more generally, I don't dispute, I wouldn't dispute at all that we are in many respects a flawed society, and a society in which very, uh, a limited amount of people more than elsewhere in the world, but nonetheless, a limited amount of people live far better than many, many multiples of that uh, elsewhere. Um, we have issues. Uh, the FTC and the FCC, and I'm not mocking it, don't agree on various issues. Our government is paralyzed sometimes. I don't have to list for you or disagree with them that the country is plagued by not only disagreement, but dysfunction. The one thing, in my view, that makes us different, and I want to say better, than any place else in the world is that we do have a First Amendment which is interpreted more broadly more protectively and more lovingly by conservatives and liberals on the court in the mo the, this year and last year. And we should be pleased with that and not change the system that we have. 
Thank you, Floyd. And that concludes the debate portion of the program. Uh, and we have a few more uh, little items for you, but before I do that, I just want to say to all four of the debaters um, how much I appreciated the way that you embodied and performed and delivered the thing that we value here, which is uh, honest, uh, respectful argument. We, we know we're all going to disagree, but we think there's a way to disagree constructively, and we think that was demonstrated by the way all of you conducted this tonight. So thank you very, very much for that. And, and Floyd, I wanted to mention, not only is this your second debate with us, but your son has debated with us also. And you yes. are, as far as I can recall, going back whatever we are now, 16 years, that you're the only father-son debate team that we've, right. that we've ever right. Right. So. In case you don't know, my son is Dan Abrams, and you ought to watch everything he's in. <laughs> um, at Open to Debate, as I mentioned, uh, we really believe in argumentation, good argumentation, which we think also requires listening for the debaters to listen to each other. I think that happened tonight. But we also like to know about your listening to the arguments that you, uh, that you heard. And we like to just know where you stand uh, but w after, after hearing everything. So I just want to ask you to show with applause um, where you are on the yes or no of the question that we uh, debated this evening. So um, for those of you who would, at this point, no matter where you started, at this point, if you are with the yes side, if you would argue, if you would agree substantially that Citizens United has undermined democracy, can you please give us a round of applause? <laughs> and, and now to the opposite side, if your position is no, Citizens United has not undermined democracy. <laughs> and the, the last thing we're interested in is how many people changed their minds in the course of the program tonight? <laughs> I failed. So this failed. was an open-minded crowd? <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask it another, another question to elicit constructive applause. How many of you, regardless of having held to, to your ground, heard something from the opposing side that's made you think differently about the issue, made you think twice? All right, the next uh, item I'd like to do is to introduce two very special guests to the stage, uh, Martha Minow and, uh, and Nell Minow, if you could come up. We're just gonna have a very brief chat. Uh, uh, so I wanna introduce Martha Minow, who's a former dean of the Harvard Law School and a human rights activist and a graduate of Yale Law, and Nell Minow, a graduate of the University of Chicago Law. Uh, an expert in corporate governance and uh, co-founder of the Corporate Library, which is a predecessor to GMI ratings. Uh, you're both here as representatives of the series that brought us here, which is named for your parents. Um, as I said at, at the beginning, our organization has enormous respect for both of your parents and especially for the role of your dad in the last century, <laughs> nearly, let's put it that way. But um, we're very honored to be back and I just wanna ask you um, to, maybe each take one question. Um, why, why it was important to have, your, your, why you feel debate is important in the context of the law school here? Um, my parents were big supporters of debates. They had uh, us debate in our family dinners. They would tell was us- Was that stressful? No, they would say, you know, Nell, you take one side and Martha take the other side and Mary can be the judge. So, yeah. And I found this today in my parents' apartment uh, my father ran a program for Northwestern in Washington for 10 years, the Annenberg program, and one of the things that he did in the program was uh, there was at the time, uh, Northwestern was a, the national champion of debate team, and he arranged for the Oxford uh, debate team to come and debate them. And I've got the video right here, which features a Northwestern student who became a major player in American politics, Frank Luntz. Wow. Yeah, so I'm giving this to you. And the other question is, what, what do you hope people got out of tonight in this debate? So our parents who met at Northwestern, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Northwestern, uh, they loved what they learned from their undergraduate class on semantics and communication. And what they really believed is that most arguments occur because people don't ask, what do you mean and how do you know? 
and what would mean so much to them about this debate is that that was the focus. People really talked about what do you mean, how do you know, and they listen. Curiosity is key and often overlooked. Well, thank you again. Thank you for having us, and thanks for spending a couple minutes on the stage. Um, I'll take that. Uh, and once again, uh, in absentia, I want to give a heartfelt thank you to Newt Minow, uh, whose leadership and legacy we have to thank for, for these debates. And especially, I want to thank our debaters, uh, Francesca and Chara, Floyd and Eric, for, as I said, approaching this whole thing with an open mind and for bringing to the table thoughtful disagreement. In short, for being open to debate. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. I'm John Donvan. We'll see you next time. <laughs>